Namaste and in la catch and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and this week's guest is Jonathan McDonald. Now, Jonathan's a really wild and crazy guy. He's one of these multi-potentialites you might have heard of. He's a non-linear thinker. He's a CEO of potency.world. He's a marketing sales manager for some talented people. Don't know who those are, but we'll find out. And he's the co-founder of Social Me Too, as well as being the global head of programming for Business Live Local. He's also involved voluntarily with the London uh, as the London coordinator for the Wellness Society for the Wellness Society International. And I think you'll really enjoy the dive we're going to take today. Quite unexpectedly, you'll find out. Jonathan, glad to have you. Mm, glad to be here. That, you see, that's like, that's what's on my LinkedIn. And actually, you missed out the bit because on my LinkedIn profile at the bottom, I've got a little smiley devil face, obscenely expensive little smiley devil face, which just cracks me up every time I see it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you could have just said, he's this guy. And and let people because with all those ti those titles don't mean nothing. I know, but it, see, I totally agree with you. Titles really don't mean anything. Identity really doesn't mean anything. However, you know, we have these ways of framing things that we kind of need data for, right? And so this gives kind of a, a playing ground or a platform to jump from. And obviously, we're going to go in a totally different direction. So let's go there. Back in the beginning, when you were first, and I know there's some events that happened in your life. We're going to get into those that, you know, those are the things that are really going to be strikingly um, interesting, I think. Mm, well, mm, carry on. And so in the beginning, though, when, when you were younger, uh, what kinds of things kind of clued you in that there was more to life than... Uh, what you were seeing, that there was another, maybe multiple worlds and in, in inside that you began to become aware of. So, and I saw you asking this question of your other guests whilst uh, quickly uh, researching before I came on. So, mm, as a result of one thing, another thing became important and as a result of that thing another thing seemed to be connected but wasn't uh and that's linked to a third thing so are we talking about the internet of things yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well i suppose literally yeah or is that um, the internet of things well but basically why would you ever think except in, I suppose, a very totalitarian regime. But why would you question your sense of perception as being different from or in some way picking up more, shall we say, how would you know? You wouldn't know. How could you know? Right. Well, and that's the interesting thing is kids, we don't, right? We have this expanded view or sense about ourselves or connectedness with the world that we it's first notion it's not second notion or second you know it's just there mm. and yet how do we connect in right how do we validate or corroborate or let alone collaborate with others of course as a kid we, you know we're like it just wanting to have fun right and be curious and not everybody's curious. Uh, you and I are some of those curious sorts that mm, kind of in. Okay, I'm going to push back on that. All right. I'm going to push back, and I, I, only because, I'm sorry. Don't be I'm, sorry, be Jonathan, uh, all right? Well, I, I will be, but I just, like, I, I'm the worst kind of politician because I've got a wild brain, and I also... <laughs> well, those yeah. are the most enjoyable, you know. No okay, focus, fair enough. All right, right? All right. And, and it's okay. Okay, this, is, well, look, this is what we miss is being able to just freely express, be raw, be real, be authentic. Cool. And as be long as you're happy with that. Oh, by the way, yeah. in case I do, am I allowed to swear? Yeah. It's like, 
I Is cannot. It? I could avoid it. Uh, avoid well, it. Yeah. Yeah. If cool. it flows, you know, I'm sure you're not going to be vulgar. No, no. I I may use a couple of hashtags that people it's either know or not. It's colloquial, right? It's how we yeah, talk Yeah, exactly. It. Exactly. So, uh, yes, about being um, searching out, seeking out, uh, what was the word you used? Inquisitive. Uh, we being are curious. Curious. So, yeah. So I watched a few of the other um, interviews and then we talked about the education system. Mm. And I was watching a post today and it talks about hierarchies in, uh, no, I'm reading a book actually called Rationality. It's heavy, hard reading, but mm. um, there are hierarchies in uh, families of sea squid in the same way as there are hierarchies throughout all of the natural kingdom basically uh, and it is based on on dominance and physical strength until we came along kind of the darwinian principle of survival of the fittest right well that's <laughs> oh dear so that isn't darwinian principles that that phrase is the mistaken belief that the mutation has to be something better from the perception of where we are now to what that thing will be. So it's not survival Given. of the fittest, it's survival of whatever suits the environment. What's best? Well, so maybe the in understanding the survival of the fittest, we perceive that it's a dominant trait that's necessary when the fittest might actually be what works best for the harmony of all. Mm. Right. So. And yeah. we, we may not get that. And of course, that's kind of why we were talking about this kind of stuff is, you know, how do we find harmony? What, what are the inner workings? What are the outer workings? How do we bridge the worlds? You know, we live <sighs> half inside and half outside. How, what's that mean? And how do we integrate a, a whole being consciously in that? And this is part of what you've been able to do. And, and others like you and I are curious enough to explore it. Mm -hmm. So uh, in answering your first question, because there are so many different tangents, all of which, any of which, would be a uh, life altering i mean look any decision so you don't have to believe in the multiverse or any version of it just recognize that a decision gives you at least two binary options mm -hmm. and from each binary option other options become true or not and so you get further and further away in divergence and that changes a life so yeah, yeah. Um, you got a lot of yes and yes and no's and then <laughs> And then the yeah. babies, right? Yeah. And, and so then so, that takes you further into the... Yeah, oh. so I'm happy, I'm very happy to have these <laughs> of universes, whole universe is just going <laughs> in my mind. Um, and it's like, um, it's like foam that you're seeing from like sponging, putting a, a soapy sponge behind the the, the material and mm -hmm. the bubbles come through the holes in the material. So they're really tiny. Right. That's how that's like that. Um, but that is, as it turns out, not really that normal. So to answer your first question, there's a lot of things I can tell you about what I knew at one point and keep it that way around and then do the reveal. Well, let's look at, you know, most people look back at their childhoods and they think, okay, what were the, the important factors? What did I, where, how did I connect initially? And did I lose that connection? And if so, how do I regain it? And what's the benefit for doing so? Okay. So, I really 
wasn't aware of many thought, or when I say it wasn't, I am no longer aware of really any memories before about four or five. Mm -hmm. that, Fundamentally, yeah. So fundamentally, one of the, uh, you know, the, these things that children say and, or you're embarrassed about when you're a small child. So I wet the bed and I wore nappies until I was at least five. Um, and the reason for that will come on to later, which is what I was saying about which which direction you want this story to go. Um, so apart from that, the most significant direction would probably, of course, that's a you know, <laughs> entirely loaded. Yeah, yeah. Listen, this is the whole point. Yeah, we kick off. I hope you've got a format because I'm a tangential kind of a guy. Well, we're following uh, it so far. Excellent. All right. So, yeah. Um, so I uh, am a mixed race person, but adopted by white British parents. Now, in 1972, which is the year I was born in England, we had... They're not as bad as the Ku Klux Klan, but basically the same ideology. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a, a pretty racist time. It was the around the time. So uh, Negroes and Irish people were banded together in English racism at one point. So mm -hmm. it's a no Negroes, no Irish, no dogs outside the pubs. So that's the that had have been the really harsh way to not at all. Put, not at no. all. Here's how here's how unharsh it was. All right. I used to watch the Dukes of Hazard. The Dukes of Hazard that. was brilliant with a Confederate flag on the General Lee, right. but there was nothing racist in that show. Not at all. So I love that show, but I, I the irony. Oh man, because you know, yeah. So right, where was I? So you had something to uh, distract yourself and, and enjoy life in the way that you could at the moment, without all the kerfuffles from the outer world impacting you. Well, yeah, yeah, basically, it would seem to be something that you know, from an outer perspective, it would be very opportunistic from those who wanted to diminish certain segments of society, let's say. I will, I will come back at you with this uh, uh, extended metaphor. So I'm mixed race, black from the racist point of view. I'm brought up by two white parents. One's a uh, technical uh, professor at university. Uh, the other's a professional photographer. Uh, obviously, all of my um, uh, extended family are white. The neighbor that I live in is white. Everyone I see is white. I'm one of only two uh, people of color in my primary school. So unless you look in the mirror, you're gold, right? You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, here's the interesting thing. And I, I, this is, uh, I'm hoping to get some contentious um, bile directed at me over this, but I haven't, I haven't so far been able to get it. Oh, excuse me a second. Right, sorry, I beg your pardon. Well, even in, in that, you know, I didn't mean to, uh, my intention was not to, to to be separative, that you were still, from your point of view, you knew no difference. There no, was... no. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is that, so I've got a very different perspective on racism because racism, and listen, George Floyd, all that rest, and that's just, the, I mean, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, both in this country, I mean, the police over here are murdering and rapists, and there haven't been police checked, and, you know, there's a I lot of there's, bad. A, there's outliers in yeah. the population, no matter exactly. what it is, and you're going to have the aberrant behavior there, it's just yes. how do we yes. minimize that. So, but the thing is this, that the argument goes that because of my ethnicity, be I Mexican, Black, or wherever it may be, um, that is the reason why I get 
pulled over, it's the reason I get searched, it's the reason I get in aggravation with, it's the reason I'm discriminated against, and it's the reason why the world is not fair to me. And I in no way ever want to ever say to anyone that that isn't true. However, what I will say is that when you grow up in a white family, the stories and the narratives about which recent history informs your family genetically, epigenetically, psychologically for generation after generation, those narratives give you a set of filters, perceptual mm -hmm. filters mm -hmm. that we know in NLP. And so I'm one of two people of color in an area that's completely white. There are ghettos of black people here, there, and everywhere. The people in the ghettos say they're pulling me over because of my color. And I'm going, if they're pulling you over because of your color, then surely I should stand out like a sore thumb in this entirely white population and should be disproportionately, even in comparison, pulled up on. But no. And I'm 48 years later before I understand that the stories we tell ourselves inform our beliefs, inform our behaviors, and therefore inform our outcomes. But most people do not know that they have agency in these things. Very true. So, yeah. So, uh, so basically, I'm a kid. I just am. Um, turns out I was mad. Um, you know, I uh, bad and glad, huh? Yeah. So um, my first record, first record was uh, Iron Maiden running free. No, it wasn't Iron Maiden. Yeah, Iron Maiden running free. And at the high school, not high school, the high, the end of primary school disco, they played uh, Run to the Hills, and I was air, I air drumming. In that I just got a chair, sat down in the middle of the dance floor, and was air drumming to it. Uh -huh. And yeah, so I, like, <laughs> whatever. Um, but the reason for that, it turns out, is about something which we can get onto later. All right. So in, <laughs> in, in that, you love how you set things up. Uh, now, in this process, though, you've really kind of example that especially with the beliefs and the agency right we make choices and we have so much um, genetically and nurturing you know from our uh, the bloodlines and, and from the current times and, and how we're nurtured or the how we perceive the world and, and the information we take in as to what it's like from those things that are around us because it's really the, the only way, way that we can at the time. Hmm. However, in the, you know, the curious sorts can look for it, but however, you've got that immediate experience, your nuclear family, your friends, your school, your neighborhood, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it impacts the, the develop. Now, in the long term, though, when you realize that, oh, wait a minute, I can choose. I don't have to fit in. And and this is the thing about uh, multipotentialites and, and nonlinear thinkers. Uh, there's a different rationale at play here, whereas I'm okay with me. I don't have to fit in. And others, you know, like your air drumming, for example, mm. right? And you just sat in the middle of the floor and did your thing and you didn't care. Mm. Right? And and that's a freedom of, of expression and, and creativity. It's joyful exuberance. Exactly. Give, give me an adult that can do that. Because the problem is not that I was prepared to do that myself. It turns out, so I'm too old at 51 to have been called dyslexic during my education. Right. A lot longer down in our story that will be revealed. But that in and of itself is the difference that you see in all art and arts is any mass manifestation of flow the mm -hmm. energy flows that we have 
and the interfaces that we have with technology, materials, people, society, whatever it is, and you see these people floating around and just effortlessly, it's like statin sliding around. If we could have organizational structures like that. Right. Well, this is the thing. Did I get, did I ever finish that thing about the hierarchy of um, sort of sea urchins? Um, oh yeah. So basically, education is hierarchical. Right. It's very hierarchical. It's very linear. But all things that have developed us to this point have been hierarchical. Without hierarchy, you couldn't have armies. Without it armies, depends. you couldn't. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I agree with you on the hierarchical hierarchical nature mm. of it. However. There's different ways that, that it's explored. And one of the things that I found as a teacher here in, in the States and, and the educational system, how it's structured and, and the lack of the holistic view of the child from the beginning and nurturing them through a particular track in life that they're most, not just adapted, uh, uh, most connected with, most resonant with where you had taken the aptitude the attitude and, and uh, the skill set and, and the passion that a child has for life and you can peer into that fairly early mm -hmm. on the other hand and, and this is probably going to get some blowback in the russian educational system and 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 so and 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 i know about this because my wife's russian She's okay. a classically trained conservatory graduate, piano teacher, and pedagogue, as well as accompanist, world class. And in their educational system, they assess the kids when they were younger or when they're young and give them a choice. She had a choice between gymnastics and piano. She chose piano. So that was her track throughout the rest of her educational life and all of the general education, the history, the language, the um, social norms, all those kinds of things that was built around that in a very rich way. And America is not like that. And yet we're envious of the discipline of others who are. And we tend to be, you know, to, to kind of want to fight with that because we want to have our free, we think it's free agency. And yet it comes later in life because we haven't had the, we never had the discipline to create the, uh, the method or the practice of critical thinking. Okay. How many different ways can I unpack that? Oh, probably a, a bunch. However, my my goal there was just to compare two different societies in the way mm. that they nurture their youth in order for the civilization itself to evolve. And we look at yes. more from America as a time value um, job orientation. Okay, I'm going to... I uh, <laughs> dearie me. Listen, if at any point you want to kick me off, <laughs> just let me know. So, so here's the thing: um, uh, education in America, but increasingly now in in uh, the UK, is a business model based on committing people to lifelong debt for the pursuit of notionary bits of paper. It eventually do, gets there, absolutely. Yeah, so I've got I've got no time for the education system um, in either of those examples, and I'll tell you for why. Because in the Russian example, which sounds great, it's about when do you have the ability to choose, and if it then determines an entire path, that could be seen as limiting. 
if you can't change it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the American version is, you know, go to a good uh, junior school, go to a good high school, you go to a good college, you get to a good university. If you can get Ivy League or the top 30, you're almost guaranteed to get in the door at KPMG or wherever it might be. And so everyone's beating themselves over it. There's a great TED talk about um, overstressed pet. No, um, um, chicken, uh, prowler chickens. It's uh, find the reference somewhere. <laughs> well, you but basically, me, you know, we were talking about uh, the interviews I had with Jeffrey Mishlove some years ago that were part of a twenty-eight year dream come true. One of them was on thinking or on hearing voices. And to your statement, I remember as a first-year student in college when my psychic senses got blown open. I would walk from the cafeteria. I, I had a job in the cafeteria. I lived in the honors dorm, which was 50 yards away. And from walking to the cafeteria to the dorm one day, I walked past students and I would hear this self horrible, self-deprecating projections at self. And they were all, I would hear this, you, blah, 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 you, blah, 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 you know, all different voices, all different kinds of, of self-deprecating comments, and yet all of them self-deprecating. And I, hearing the you, I thought it was me, right? Because I'm hearing all of this, and I didn't know how to differentiate between the personal you and the general you at that mm. time. And so I'm hearing all of this, and I'm thinking it's all about me, and it totally freaked me out to the point where I locked myself in my dorm room for three days and wouldn't come out until a friend of mine came over and asked, hey, was it your voice or others' voices? And at that point, I was able to make that separation. Wow. So you were hearing the internal voices of the insecurities of all the people around you. And having my own, it made it very easy to assume that it was me. Indeed, because why would you understand that unless you had real mental control? Mm, interesting. Which is what I began to develop at that point, because our minds are, are they're just a, this amazing untapped tool and, and access to infinite intelligence that we don't even recognize yet because mm. we're still too focused in, in the uh, imposter syndrome. Right? Mm. Um, now, how did you, in bridging that, well, let, let's just dive in. Okay, so you, later in life, you you had some tremendous challenges. I mean, you had some experiences, as I recall you descriptive or describing them, of mm. um, a series of strokes. Uh, that, that's, yeah. That was later. I'll just, I'll just do them in quicker, in quicker order. Um, so basically, uh, adopted the baby. Sure, just take over. Up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> wasn't picked up for it. Well, because otherwise, it's like I don't want to be laborious about the injuries because it's not about the injuries; it's about well, the I'm, the thinking. Totally, totally hear it, and you're very humble in that respect, and and yet it was profoundly impactful uh, as far as your ability to recognize things. Yes, but that's luck. So. Basically, okay. yeah. Uh, well, definitely. So, uh, first thing to happen, uh, I've gone through my childhood and uh, adolescent life and early, uh, late teenage years without any problems, massively reckless, you know, uh, very gregarious, very. Uh, uh, started riding motorbikes, changed jobs to buy a motorbike. Um, and had this uh, job with a company car and I was living at home. And so I bought this motorbike, had these motorbikes and really, really, really powerful sports, uh, sports bikes. You know, the sort of, you go <laughs> oh, yeah. like that. My son and, had a 1200 Ducati. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I had the CBR uh, 900s, uh, the Fireblade. Um, and my God, the power. Anyway, so 1996, have a motorcycle accident. Upper, side, upper right side of the body there is, is uh, paralyzed, including the lung. Um, because the lung wasn't supported, it pressed on my stomach, which meant for about five years, I projectile vomit three or four or five times a day, uh, addicted to um, 
uh, morphine. Uh, uh, my God, you look at the morphine problems in America at the moment. Back in 1996, I was taking enough morphine to kill three horses. So uh, that was quite savage. And then the pain is so excruciating. Even now, it's just that now I've got different strategies, but it's it's like it's like you're being shredded apart whilst also burned, frozen, electrocuted and crushed. Um, and it's right in the front of your head all of the time. And the only way at the time I could picture it, the only internal representations I could make, you know, the Death Star blowing up, you know, planets exploding, you know, volcanoes, you know, you know, uh, all sorts of mad, crazy, murderous, terrible things. Um, and I didn't really deal with that at all well. Uh, I'm functioning alcoholic, functioning a uh, drug addict. And when I say functioning, producing these remarkable effects as a middle manager working for you remember when yellow pages was a directory a book that company mm -hmm. um and yes i'm doing all this and it was only because of a change of focus that i stopped taking all the hard drugs um and changed my life basically uh, and that was because of a reframe where I went back to the hospital that had treated me and I was volunteering for hospital radio it's like an internal radio st uh, station for the hospital and you see the adolescence ward and it's the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital it's the European Central for blah, 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 blah. so yeah. you've got kids there from from all over Europe um, with cancers, with limbs being removed, with um, just um, scoliosis. These children are... They you forgot any kind of trauma. You can oh, imagine that these kids were... Yeah, exactly. yeah. And here's the thing. When I had the bike accident, it wasn't my fault and I was going within the speed limit, honestly, my lad. Um, but kids don't choose that sort of thing. And so I then made it my business because it seemed to me that people don't really understand children. I don't think they remember being them um, or possibly it's not a memory system that I'm using for these skills. But basically, children don't know what they don't know. They, if, for them, it just is. Right. And right. so, they don't know what they can't do, so they just yeah, do. They just, it just exactly. Right. And so, basically, all these volunteers would give their time, and they go up to these kids and they go, "Oh, Jimmy, would you like, would you like a, uh, would you like a request on the radio?" I'm like, "My God, have you never spoken to a child?" So I did this scripted intro. I'd buy bags of sweets. I had this posse. I had this recorder. So uh, just a, a mad, awesome time. So I went from taking drugs and being really, really um, depressed on a I Friday. Think you got yeah. the feedback from the kids that was just, uh, I would well, think, you know, dealing with that. This was like a breath of fresh air for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so it's it was so it was so funny because I was the only yeah uh, anyway um, but basically they saved my life because I was drug driving I was drink driving not recovering from drink driving going out drink driving mm -hmm. horrifying selfish and. I am so fortunate that I didn't kill someone. I don't give a shit if I killed myself. I wanted to die. That's the thing. Um, I think people that say that suicide uh, people are taking the easy way out should maybe um, uh, take a moment to think about how they do it themselves and see if they're um, brave or... or um, selfish um but yeah so good point yeah so that experience turned me on a different path 
where I started to use what I'd learned in neurolinguistic programming to I've written it as, to, uh, oh God, it's to, these things go backwards and forwards. Right. So I started using NLP in communication techniques right. and you learn about some ideas. Cognitive reframing. Yeah, yes. Cogn you know, being, I'm kind of a cognitive scientist and what that really means is that I look for patterns. Yeah. Everywhere. And that's how we operate is pattern Recognition. activity, habit, thinking, all of those kinds of things to be aware of that to be, and then allows you to step back from it and alter those patterns for yourself. Yes, but only in my case after I'd had the strokes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, had the uh, motorcycle now we're back to that again. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I had the motorcycle I had the motorcycle accident, six years of horror changed my direction went a certain way then uh, a few years after that i fell over broke my wrist so i haven't got my upper right hand side fell over broke my left wrist was in a plaster cast for 18 weeks then trapped the medium nerve so i can't feel the tips of my fingers i can't pick things up off surfaces um my oh just loads of yeah so i'm sort of you know a uh, 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 hook away um and then uh, mother died on uh, Christmas Eve 2003, which was an emotional blow. And then uh, six strokes the year after that till 2006. And I didn't go to the doctor until the fifth one because they just were, they're called TIAs and it's transient something or the other for it. A so it just seemed like a different moment of consciousness yeah. and, and yeah. then it passed and you didn't really think about it. That's yeah. I wonder how but, many of us actually have those and, and don't recognize it. Well, as I now have become aware, and I used the term woke in the book I wrote before the uh, hijacking of the word woke by the right wing as uh, some sort of bad thing. Um but yeah, I once I had awoken to myself, which is uh, how I used it, I became incredibly compassionate because I had honestly thought until, so how old, when did I hear? So I only figured out that there was a difference in at the end of December 2016. I'd had an inkling in the year before reading a couple of books. One of the books was called Seeing What Other People Cannot See, The Hidden Talents of Visual Thinkers and Differently Wired Brains. Hmm. Kind of the pre multipotentialite you read that book, I read that book, it's got a, a, a you know, some of the well-known um, paradigm shifters, and um, I'm reading about my own school days, I'm reading about my own situation. Well, this um, is the thing that's really, uh, pardon me for just blurting in, you know, those loose associators, really, you got to forgive us. <laughs> Everybody that reaches this kind of, of, let's say, a state of understanding about their connectedness to the world and others, most of us have gone through some kind of really similar um, process or, or experience as you know, youngsters, mm. right? And we don't necessarily recognize it. It's, it's almost like a rite of passage. Mm. I wonder if that same rite of passage as we look back and, and consider reflect um embrace forgive would that lead us to a more natural flow of understanding ourselves and others i'm not sure because we don't really this is part of why I'm having conversations with folks like you is like, let, let's explore this and see how we can benefit from each other, compare and reflect our 
individual growth patterns and see if there's a similarity across the board that we can honor and, and learn how to collaborate with from that core of empathic resonance that it produces. Yes. And so <clears throat> three clauses, which one am I going to go with? Great. Right, right. um, <laughs> Let's start with the uh, and. Yes. Uh, so, and after I'd finished writing my book in November 2020, uh, I read a book called The Gift of Dyslexia. And throughout my my book was written about this coaching program I tried to deliver for primary age children after all my strokes and I was giving up. I didn't think I had any life left. So I made this thing. I was volunteering, loved children, blah, 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 writing a book about it. And because I'm writing a book about how it is I'm over to able to overcome things, I'm consistently self-reflecting and looking because obviously memory isn't real. Memory rep is representative and is also subject to biases and it's also subject to perspective so um it's uh it's interesting that if i say something and you say something different i don't go rrr, rrr, rrr. i go Ooh, because you've got a perspective i've not got yet um Aren't but we all that, assimilationists in that perspective when we are open to others no we are not no, we are not. So let me read you this bit from The Gift of Dyslexia. The mental function that causes dyslexia, it's, the irony of me reading it is not lost on me. The mental function that causes dyslexia is a gift in the natural, in the true sense of the word, a natural ability, a talent. It is something special that enhances the individual. Dyslexics don't all develop the same gifts, but they do have certain mental functions in common. Here are the basic abilities all dyslexics share. They can utilize the brain's ability to alter and create perception, the primary ability. They're highly aware of the environment. They're more curious than average. They think mainly in pictures instead of words. They're highly intuitive and insightful. They think and perceive multidimensionally using all the senses. They can experience thought as reality and they have vivid imaginations. Now, I said that to you with the first time we talked, and that's why we're now doing this. So that is a dyslexic trait. However, as I'm continuously researching, I think that it is an emergent property that is the same in neurotypical brains as in neurodivergent brains. It's just that they're using DOS and we're using, you know, whatever the OS. <laughs> yes, yes, whatever. So it's the software because someone can wander around a day thinking about their job and their boss and their girlfriend and their uh, car insurance and their home. Blah, 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 blah. And each of those thoughts occurs as a words or pictures or feelings. And so that is a, that is a chunk of mental energy. And so typically, People think about the things they don't want rather than the things they do want. Absolutely. And so they don't attract. So you're saying attractive, the term attracted, there was something you, the phrase. You, resonance? That, no, no, it was the one for. Oh, the assimilation. Was, yes. Well, the, here's how I was seeing that in <laughs> that as we experience anything, we assimilate what's in it for us. And that may be a different view. It may be a similar view. It may be a new idea, um, something that's been outside of our purview previously. And now that we have it, there's this natural assimilation process that perhaps we do it unconsciously initially. But as you're talking about the same hardware that we're given and the software is actually what's malleable, Mm -hmm. And we can change the programming through that to recognize what we do take in, how we process it. Is it, you know, the, from a Taoist perspective, perspective, is it desirable or 
undesirable. And if it's undesirable, then what do we do with it? Mm. If it's desirable, then what do we do with it? <laughs> it's same mm. questions. And yet they often lead. It's like the, and, and this just occurred to me in the um, Jewish tradition, the His Hasidic or Kabbalah, that there's the 72 names of God, right? 36, um, what do they call them? 36 greater, 36 lesser. Okay. Right? Oh, there's no way. And so th these are some of the internal teachings. In that nameage or that nomenclature, we there's the greater and the lesser, so we may see them as angels and demons, and it, yet in effect they are both leading us toward the one. That being that the greater kind of gives the memo, and the lesser tests to see if you got it. And both this even in the yin and yang, right? It's all part of that one. So how do we? How do you see that? In reflection and i suspect you've got some ways that you've worked to integrate that concept at, at least uh peripherally in your life if maybe if not at a much deeper level so it, it was at a very much deeper level because i was designing this program whilst volunteering after my strokes my strokes were the things that allowed me to rebuild my consciousness through neuroplasticity and therefore uh demonstrating neuroplasticity be, to be true uh i've also demonstrated that um pushing yourself out of your comfort zone causes the myelin cables around your neuroleptic senses yeah that becomes stronger so you get yeah so i have demonstrated all that because Four years after my strokes, there was a guy in the town with me. He had five, I'd had six. We're not counting yard yard. He was walking as I. Uh, he was walking with a a frame. I was walking with a stick and a, a brace on my leg. Six years later, he was in a wheelchair. I'm walking what appears to be normally, and the reason I can do that is because I go to the gym every day. And so, if I stop for more than two days it takes me five days to recover mm. so the new the gone oh an interesting point it, i can relate my wife uh she had a stroke in in 2008 you can imagine a, a pianist with a stroke having the right side of her body paralyzed she couldn't talk for a couple of years she brought herself back simply by playing every day she had no physical therapy to to speak of beyond that she just was disciplined every day mm -hmm. she sat at the piano and she brought herself back with that neuroplasticity that was capable yeah, uh, yeah. we're all capable of, of doing if we just choose to right it's the discipline it's the perseverance it's the persistence and, and tenacity that one has to have to get over the fears of not being able to do it and just go do it but and the trouble today, is she's you couldn't tell she's yeah. sight reads you know in classical pieces like you would not believe I, I would believe and you know um i'd also believe that um she might be dyslexic too because this ability to continuously create new iterations and improve and improve and improve this virtuous circle as it was called in some business terms that's mm -hmm. something i see again and again and again with dyslexic people so um but when right i went off on a tangent what question were you were you on am i answering we we've been having uh, multiple tangents so we were on yes. the end and now let's go to the soul okay well you had three separate you know the if and and so right so we're, oh we're so. oh thank you very I'm much i'm trying to keep hey, up with you man you, you're i tell, to keep hey, up with I tell you what All this right? is a good team effort yeah um so um for my entire life until i learned i was dyslexic people would say to me jonathan this is the situation and i'd look at them and go 
10, 15, 20, 30. Halos. Like, um, like going to a 3D movie without the 3D glasses on. The, the, the three cameras slightly out of line. Sure. So, and I had genuinely thought that people saw what I saw and were deliberately choosing to be a uh, victim. And until very recently, so 2016, so until 2015, I was using a phrase which when you can either step up or you can um, remove yourself in a way that's um, somewhat more... Um, um, unceremonious. Yes, unceremonious. What? Yeah, you see, it's the art. Um, so, because only about four or five percent of the population or it might be eight percent now are dyslexic i don't think that brains that have been conditioned in the neurotypical education system have the internal purpose driven value of one's uniqueness and i don't think it's an accident and I think it's got worse so that the younger people are even less able to filter out the crap and tune into the oneness. Right. Well, from a, I, I totally agree with you. Um, and it seems that that's been. That's a, a very dangerous thing to say. <laughs> well, you know, no, no. it, it is teasing. what it is. And, and seeing it as it is, what do we do about it? And this, from a question standpoint, why is it that way? Well, when you consider the growth of a global population, right, we start out with the little um, the communities and then the, uh, they grow and, and then there's regional development and then there's, you know, uh, population density and, and how do we manage all of that? And there's a few who place themselves because of their abilities and, and, a, and skills that they've put themselves in a place of managerial responsibility for the rest mm -hmm. of us. And so how do they manage that? Well, they could, one method that the hierarchical way, right, is to have everybody painting inside the lines. Mm. And guys like you and me, we don't. Right? We paint outside the lines usually first, right? Yes. <laughs> or, or at least we question the lines. Yeah. And I accept that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And often find ourselves outside the lines with our creative capacity. You know, you with your programs, with the the, the music, the intro music for the show. Right. I'm playing drums. Probably mm. nobody even knows that. Um, mm. But that's another side of me. It, yeah able to explore and i think that many of us are like that we have multiple you know you hear this pick the one thing right and go after that well what if that one thing encompasses multiple activities so i don't know if you do this this is what i've been doing all my life i see how someone produces a thing and I don't need to know all the work. It's NLP. It's, it's you truncate the learning. You show me how you got the result. That's all I need to know to take that result and combine it with this, 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 this. And I, in my head, there's software programs that do this, but my mapping, it's like, you know, 20 tangents or something like that, that come off. Um, and um, that, oh, uh, I've lost my thread. 20 tangents coming off and you've got a, a huge mind map of interconnectedness. But what were we talking about before that? What was the context? Uh... The context was in being able to see things differently and, um, and operate yeah. life with, uh, well, multiple it was, with multiple it was... things. Right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I've lost, I've lost my train completely. Duh, forget it. I was trying to find the train here in my notes and, and I'm nah, not, nah. So. I, listen, 
I don't know what I'm going to say from one moment to the next. So trying to recall it. This is the problem with being dyslexic is that the you have these multiple uh, streams of consciousness and only one mouth. Um, Isn't that a problem? Yeah. Right. Because it, and I totally agree in, in you know, when you think about it, you've got 60 to 70,000 thoughts going on in your head, according to modern theory anyway. Mm -hmm. and all of how do you articulate right that's how do you pick which ones to come out your mouth mm -hmm. that will affect those that are around you in some way yeah right i was looking for a mind map that I, oh here it is all right there's yeah. a perfect mm -hmm. example of what we're talking about this is the yeah. mind map that i have for the live and let live foundation of which i'm executive director of for the mm -hmm. global peace movement Right. So there's all these kinds of th things that we think about. And part of what we were talking about was the way that people are managed from keeping them inside the lines as opposed yes. to incorporating the diversity. The, this is why diversity and inclusion today has so much traction is mm -hmm. because those that didn't fit in and are happy that they didn't are now saying, hey, look, we can help two just mm -hmm. listen to us and maybe things will change yeah right we're not asking for you know these huge sweeping destructive changes that's not who we are we're very compassionate considerate pragmatic um, loving, hmm. right and i i feel that with you you really care that's authentic that's raw that's real and society today has been diminishing that capacity. We have to stand in that place to be in the moment fully. Do you, ha do you have to experience trauma? Because, you know, look, when you don't have any arms and you're a, how old was I at the time? A 28-year-old man. You haven't had someone wipe your bum and feed you and wash you. You learn humility pretty mm. damn quickly um and vice and, versa for the one who's giving the caregiving too well yeah and you, but you see it's uh you know what do you do in those situations how do you uh, interact how do you uh communicate it's just a so so it's only because of the things that have happened to or for me um that i am now the person i am and that is one of deliberate thought and intent based on producing a consistent result over so when did i have my last stroke 2006 so where are we now uh 17 years so so uh, not quite so, six and a half years since i had my last stroke we can so, round up. yeah uh, <laughs> so that is the amount and Building mental maps is a skill that you burn into your visual cortex, presumably, um, if you run visual simulations. Mm -hmm. So I r have run thousands and thousands, millions, billions, more than I can conceive of, just a, a number, some huge number, because I've got 16 different spheres all spinning at the same time running. <laughs> um in perceptual terms so um i only can see it because the stroke slowed my brain down in that book the gift of dyslexia it says that visual thinking which is what you and i do as opposed to verbal reasoning which is how all education works education says yeah it's the it's the narrative mm -hmm. um basically that means that maybe at the end of the sentence you know something but that might mean a load more questions but it's it's a very is basically limited to the ability to comprehend speech right. um very audio very audio so visual thinking 
uh, is by this book's estimation between 400 to 2000 times faster. Now I read that book three and a half years after finishing my own book. And in one of the chapters in my own book, I'm trying to understand, I don't understand. And I go, it just seems like I'm using, and the term I use is several orders of magnitude, which I didn't even know what the term meant. I just never heard the word, it means multiples of 10. Um, than other people and I just I, I, I'm just this is it, it's just I, I, I don't think anything of it I'm just writing it down and then after the event then I find out oh that's the reason why so yeah I think brain trauma uh, can be an opportunity um, I know all strokes are different uh, but I am fundamentally, uh, from your own wife's story, from my own uh, uh, um, state, uh, I do not accept anything, <laughs> basically, as the way it is. You show me what you got, then let me get to work. Well, yeah, and, and reality is malleable. You know, it's interesting how you <clears throat> framed, and not just interesting, intriguing how you framed that it slowed you down right yeah and, and here's the the optimal expression or or uh what is it the flow right it's a yeah. psychology of optimal experience this allows us to to slow down this is something that we can incorporate and many do through meditation practices of, of the slowing of the watching of our thoughts of the observing of self in a very slow manner that allows us then to make better choices as coming out of that now there's another reference that i really like that we don't consider in for the most part and that's nothingness the complete absence right this mm -hmm. is the what we hear or what we've referred to as the silence in which had you know the voice of being resides mm -hmm. or in the um the quiet in, in the the absence of thinking and and rarely can we get into that place it's a discipline that can be learned however guys like you it's not a learning it's just what develops and, and granted there is some learning right in, in the how do you deal how do you manage this new area of perception and then what do we do with that how does it work where do we take it how can we integrate it with others what are the outstanding benefits that we can recognize so we can focus on those first mm -hmm. rather than and, and take that diversity as to how does that complement what we have how do we so, do, how do you find that that's in play or is it and, and what do you think we can do to bring it more into play okay so uh there was an article a friend of mine a connection uh sent to me um about how linkedin had made dyslexic thinking a skill so it's listed as one of my skills i also have it as a on the tagline of my my profile so um Bloody hell. Ask me Many again. different directions. Find one. <laughs> yeah. What was the last thing you asked me? Um, mentioned. Do you feel like these things are oh yeah, right. Okay. So okay, then, good. Yeah. So this pulling together of different things that I do. I read a book in 2019, the end of 2019, called Rebel Ideas by Matthew Syed and that thing i've just described to you i'm reading this book recombinative innovation so recombinative that's, that's interesting. recombinative re no recombinative right that's what i was trying to say recombinative <laughs> yes right? a new one so there's a, a moment of apocalypse um <laughs> right? 
And, and we've had many in this conversation. This is the, the real joy of having these chats is they're apocalyptic for you, for me, for the audience, and, and we all win. So there's yeah. a, the triple. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so what, what did you get from that? How did it? Um, so that explained what I'd been doing and I've been doing it all my life. And I've been doing it without even really thinking about it. It just is what I do. So it's not like I turn on my my diversity. I just is. And so, so did that understanding of how you are help you to better accentuate. Uh, accentuate is possibly the wrong word that I was. Uh, so, I, I was trying to say uh, attenuate, but that no. Okay, well the word I'll use is show compassion towards, for, and considerate, because even better. I, well, I don't know. Better. You brought so, it down into the sensory. I, I was still in my head in the question. Yeah, you well, brought look, it down into the the feeling world. And I, I, yeah, I mean, it's. So, oh man, there's so many things. I reflect. Once I lear start learning about the way my brain works, I'm reflecting. It's like journaling, but it was all written down for this book purposes. Sure. And I reflect that I see things from many different points of view. And I've just written this down. I haven't read this in anyone else's book at this stage. I've just written it down. And everyone around me seems to get so angry. And everyone around me so much wants to show me that their truth is real, screaming their truths at me. And I'm like, but it just isn't. And it took me 18 months. Took me. It takes me more than 18 seconds. I've got a problem. Took me 18 months to shut down my multiple perspectives, inhabit a singular one, and understand what that means for the perception of most people in our societies today. That's huge. And I don't know this to be true, but it would seem to me that if you can only see what you can see and maybe, oh, yeah, you know, maybe I'll get a watch or I'll, you know, some linear micro improvement. What people experience is what they think it is, is what they think is rather. Right. So whereas what I experience is one version that I'm currently experiencing. And if I don't want this one, I choose another one. And that, that kind of neuroplasticity, right? Well, making. So here's what I think it is. You take multiple perspectives. They're all happening at the same time. So I operate in the still world or else I bump into things, but mm. internally, perceptually, and it's not, see, here's the whole thing. I see what other people see. It's not about what's out here. It's about what I do with it in here. And in here is going, <laughs> like that right. and so i go oh that's why people are so angry because for me reality itself is fluid is it not i mean the reality we, we're now and, and this is one that's huge and, and thank you for bringing that up jonathan because it first of all it gives the understanding of where others see reality from and, and that that kind of like i said before you brought it down in, with the statement you made you brought it down into the feeling world most of us live from the shoulders up right the, the body is an instrument we don't know how to tune let alone play in concert with mm. right? those are the feelings the emotions the senses that we have of being able to expand and perceive a greater reality because they're all multiple choices in any moment that can be made in order how to perceive mm. how to bring it into yourself that's not even including where you take it inside and where it can go as a result. Now, how did you find a way to take that 
information and, and that understanding of yourself and do the conversion factor, right? Do the inner and outer where you, you found a place where you can find harmony in the chaos mm -hmm. and then bring that exterior world of others into the picture. How did that transpire for you? And, and what did you find that could be a benefit for those in the same situation? Um, so I've been in various situations, which is why I can be quite empathic. You've got, you know, injury, accident, loss of parent, blah, 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 quite a few experiences, adoption, all sorts of stuff. So, um, not understanding why, but understanding why, if you know what I mean, people would talk to me and tell me all sorts of things. And, um, I have been, I've been mistaken a lot in life. There's a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey. I, I think was thinking about young. the fifth, the, yeah. fifth well, I, the, yeah, the first understand before being understood. Well, there's that, but there's the other one, uh, which is to listen compassionately, respond emotionally. So hmm. for 46 years or 35 years, I've been, people are going to me, Jonathan, this is the problem. And I've been going, but, 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 and each one of those buts for me is just another idea, but for them is their entire, their entire perception of reality. I can't go, but to what you've just told me is truth for you, but I didn't learn that. And even now I know it, it's so difficult for me to shut up that I limit my exposure to them because I feel their pain and I can no longer be irritated at them for being lackeys and, and um, ill contents. Mm -hmm. They are doing the best they can with the system they're running. So in answer to the question, my backdrop, potency.world, is a new education design, but it's not just that. It's a business transformation. It's a social life and um, work-life balance uh, proposition. And, and it is an entire shunt of multiple systems at multiple levels, all at the same time, so that the result it produces is so significant that the needle actually shifts. Um, so that is that how- That might be a, a perfect <laughs> compliment for the work that we're doing with Live and Let Live. And That's what we're talking. Yeah, absolutely. And this is how it happens, right? This, these are yeah. the things we, we explore. We, we because read. it was Janine, wasn't it, who put me in touch with you? Yeah. Yeah. So. She goes, yeah, this is a, this is a guy Zen's going to like. Oh, I forgot to say at the beginning, by the way, namaste. And um, I, uh, I, I thought I'd return with a, uh, uh, okay. Um, survey, which means it's a pleasure to serve. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. And then I've got one other thing, if you'd like. Um, but we can save that to the wrap up if you well, like. Sure, sure. Now, was that um, Latin? That was Latin. Yeah. Okay. One that I love in Latin is uh, uh, "vocatus atque non vocatus dus aderet," and it Ooh. means invoked or not invoked. The gods are watching, <laughs> <laughs> and because they do, there are these little tasty tidbits of connection that can evolve into magnificent productions and uh, and have tremendous effect on the world in very positive ways. Mm -hmm. And that's how I feel this momentum is it, during this time of, okay, we've had our sequestration, we've had our obsession on self-hydrine, we've had our trauma, we've had all of the things that have built us into who we are now. Now, what do we want to do with it? How can we be who we are truly? I don't think we even know who we are yet, but how can we be that? You know, if God's love, then we're love, 
right? We're the we're, we're the yes. created of the creator. So if that is energy, it's unqualified, then we choose how to qualify it because we have that creative capacity of what? Free will. We don't. You think? Not even slightly. All right. Not, so even, not even you or I. So how do you, I can see how in some ways, once you make one choice, it eliminates all others, right? And is it possible sure, that in that nothingness that we, that I spoke of earlier, that there is a created or a, how can I put it, uh, on an individuated level, kind of like a ah. philosophy, right? Where everything, we are all threads of that divine, right? Yeah. So yeah. is there a possibility then that that perfected form, fit, and function in the world eliminates all other choices? So that there's this destiny that is floating around at the base of our being that we haven't begun to explore yet. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Well, um, when you when you uh, speak about the uh, choice to tune in to what you and I seem to experience because there's crossover in our discussions and things and references and stuff like that. And you go, oh, okay, I can see this guy's thinking works this way. Huh. And that's why we're having a laugh. Yeah, I said to you when I first spoke to you last week, within like 10 minutes, I said, we're going to have to speak again. Um, so look, it appears more so with people on various spectra than with neurotypical, more neurotypical brains, if we say it's a spectrum, not binary, but, you know, they're leading up to, sure. so okay. leading up to a point, I think people are hampered by, then there's a nudge in the middle who are talked down to, and then there's people at the far end who have never given a, uh, a fig what people think and as a result of that are simply single-minded purposeful and results oriented um they are the sort that frighten education as it currently stands so i don't think that existing humans myself included um and I don't believe that the next step in evolution is going to be a necessarily physical manifestation. I, the last chapter of my, or not chapter, the last section of my book was called a treatise on the evolution of human consciousness. Hmm. Because I'd noticed how children glow and I noticed how dull adults are before I really could accept that I see energy. Um, so my solution is to create new human consciousness, which will, by dint of its ability to be adaptable, collaborative and nimble, become reproductively successful in the uh, Darwinian um the mutation that uh meets the uh situation prevails because i think we can all see that we're not slowing down driving the species and the civilization off a cliff um it's not going to stop it's going to carry on until even the rich are Maybe they have to get out of the rocket and go out of the, out of the world, but you know, there's going to get a wonderful explanation. That, and what you're saying, um, I agree with that. There, there's a it's like a bio spiritual evolutionary process, it's internal. And okay. there's a, a Russian academia, speaking of Russian, right? I, yeah. I love uh, there's so much richness in, in their culture and people that we've been marginalized, yeah. Uh, from and we we need to embrace that there is a, a woman by the name of valentina morovna and she has two degrees she's um, in biochem and astrophysics i believe mm. uh, russian academy that is the highest um, academy of science 
title given right. in Russia. Wow. So she shared a dissertation that has been called the global mutation in humanity. And what she's done is she's gone through the last 10 years of scientific discoveries about how consciousness and our own spiritual evolutionary process is producing genetically effective results as well, or perhaps that these genes are naturally unpacking because of a different area of space, cosmologically subtle energy shifts, vibrational shifts, that changes the picture of things, right? And so this, this uh, I think it's a 49 minute dissertation goes into the very things that you and I have been talking about from a scientific standpoint. Of how what interesting. Are and how she's brought it. So it, it's huge. It's had almost a million views. It was published in 2018. You have to send me the link if you remember. I will. I will. Yeah. And I'll also well, have this... that below the, the description as well as uh, hopefully the, the link to your book too. Uh, yes, I can send you that by all means. Um, so um, that that's that's an interesting thing that I, I'll just the one two things to, to just uh, end on from my point of view, and then I'll let you do your show wrap. Um, and um, the first thing is a so I saw the actor Jeff Goldblum being interviewed uh, on a chat show in the UK and he um, read out this quote at the end of the show and it really really resonated with me and it is the energy frequency with which I live my life so this is the true joy in life being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I'm of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community, and as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it what I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. For the harder I work, the more I live. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle to me. It's a sort of splendid torch, which I've got hold of for the moment. I will make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. Wow. Nice spin on Shakespeare too. Uh, it's George Bernard Shaw, actually. Right. Yeah. Well, the out out the candle reference. Uh, oh, is that? Oh, okay. So I'm not that. That comes well from out out brief candle. Life has been a poor player who struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then has heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying from, nothing. Then? What's it from? What play um, is that from? Macbeth, I believe. Oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Love you, man. This has been just an amazing conversation, unlike any I have had so far. Um, <laughs> obviously, right? You're very unique. Um, mm. And I love you for that. And I know others will too. This is going to be a, a wonderfully received conversation. And I thank okay. you. Okay. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me. And um obviously send me the video oh we will do, we will do yeah. this as necessary guaranteed and uh and we'll learn how to work together better in the process excellent okay well i'll show up and you can do your show close all right uh and and thank you for not shutting up the whole time it's uh it's been a wonderful conversation and i know our guests have enjoyed it i sure have and with thank that you. namaste namaste yeah. In La Kecha La Kin. I'm Zen Benefil, your host for One World. Thank you for One World in a New World. One World's the old show. Uh, I talk about reflecting, right? I went and stepped in the Wayback Machine for a moment, uh, minus Peabody and Sherman. Thank you again for sticking with us. I look forward to seeing you next time. I'm Zen Benefil, and I'll see you next time.